Welcome to the Audacity to Podcast, episode 148, the good, the bad, and the ugly from the Ninth Podcast Awards. Thank you for joining me for the Audacity to Podcast. I'm Daniel J. Lewis, and this is the award-winning how-to podcast about podcasting and using Audacity. It's where I give you the guts and teach you the tools to podcast with passion, organization, and dialogue. The ninth annual podcast award slate was just announced, so now you can look to see what you can vote for in the podcast awards over at podcastawards.com. I'm really excited to say that several of our shows, including this one, the Audacity to Podcast, have made it into the finalists and you'll be able to start voting on November 1st through the 15th. It's a daily vote. So if you want to learn more, I'll tell you more about it later on, but please go to the Audacity to Podcast.com slash podcast awards to see how you can support us in the podcast awards. But Each time that the Podcast Awards slate is announced, and that is all of the nominations are pulled together and put out there ready to vote, each time it's announced, Todd Cochran, the CEO of Blueberry Raw Voice Podcast Connect, the founder of the Podcast Awards, shares a state of the podcast union. And it's a lot of numbers, a lot of information. I definitely recommend go over to podcastawards.com and watch the full video and get his take on these numbers. But I'll also have the video embedded in the show notes for this episode at the audacity to podcast.com slash 148. But I want to share with you some of my perspective on this stuff because there's some good news and there's some really, really, really bad news of what podcasters are doing. And this may not be something you're doing. You may not have even tried to get into the podcast awards. If you did and you didn't make it, I do have some information about what may have happened that made you ineligible or why you might not have made it into the nominations for one of the categories. Let's start with the good stuff about this. Each podcast that's nominated is graded on several things. And I'll break that down a little bit in detail with uh, the percentages of these different podcasts and how they performed on some of these things. And we don't know the exact grading scale that is used for the podcast awards. But most likely, some of these things are taken into consideration. We know just some general scales, and those are that your your website design actually matters for your podcast and some other things. Here's how it breaks down. 40% of your eligibility to show up in the podcast awards finalists, 40% comes from the number of nominations. 20% comes from the relevance of your content. So if you are claiming to be a magic carpet podcast and you're talking about silverware, that's irrelevant content. So the relevance of your content, 20%, that's a heavy ranking for the relevance of your content. But I think very important that your content be relevant. If you claim to be a certain kind of podcast, be that kind of podcast. 15% comes from your website design quality. 15% comes from your sound quality. So blog talk radio you're probably not going to see any of those in the podcast awards. 10% comes from podcast delivery and show format quality. That's the overall breakdown, but then we get an idea of some of the extra details that are involved based on what Todd shares in the state of the podcast union. There's some good stuff, some bad stuff, and some quite ugly stuff. The good stuff is only 7% of the podcasts, and this is of 4,400 podcasts that were nominated for the podcast awards, not just the finalists, and this certainly isn't every single podcast out there, but this is of the 4,400 podcasts that were nominated. Each of them went through a certain checklist, and this is information that was found. So this is all based on these 4,400 nominated podcasts for the podcast awards. Only 7% had non-branded sites. That is, they have their own kind of domain of some sort, and they're not using mypodcast.lipson.com or mypodcast.wordpress.com or anything like that, some kind of generic service. Only 7%. That's good. Let's try and get that number down to 0%. All of us should have our own websites, our own branded sites to us, not to someone else's service. 83% 
have a findable iTunes link. This is great because iTunes is still the big player for podcast subscriptions, not just the iTunes store on your desktop computer, but also on mobile devices like iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch. iTunes is the best place to be for your podcast, but also other places are important. So having that iTunes link on the site is very important. I wonder how many of these iTunes links are links that actually open directly into iTunes or how many of them just link you to the page where you then have to click open in iTunes. They didn't share that information. I would guess there's a high percentage of these iTunes links that are just links to the page, but don't open iTunes for you. And I've talked about how you can do that before. And now the affiliate program has changed from link share over to PHG, but the way you do it is pretty much the same. 95% of the podcasts do have their own .com. That's great. How this number coincides with the 7% non-branded site is a little bit odd, but I think where that crossover comes in are certain podcasts may have their own .com, but they're using a non-branded site. So it looks like a standard Libsyn.com blog or podcast site, but it is your own podcast domain, like myawesomepodcast.com might be your own podcast domain, but it's it's using the Libsyn template or the WordPress.com template, something like that. But having your own .com, very important. This is great for branding, especially when you move off of one of these third-party services and get your own site and design it well. Then having your own domain name means that you don't have to try and redirect people or pay extra to have certain services redirected for you. 95% your own domain name, that's fantastic. By the way, if you're interested in ordering a domain name, I've currently got a special going. I can resell domains. So if you go to theaudacitypodcast.com slash domains, you can check out how you can register a domain now really inexpensively just for a little bit longer. 92% of these 4,400 podcasts are using WordPress. This is great. I think it really shows how mature WordPress is as a platform and how popular it is among podcasters. It makes podcasting so easy with the PowerPress plugin. Other places out there, like I know Twit uses Drupal. 5x5 Network uses their own proprietary content management system. And other podcast services out there probably use something that's proprietary or some form of Drupal, Joomla, or something else like that that they're working with. Maybe even Expression Engine or some of those other services. 71% of the podcasts publish only audio format. 15% publish only video. That number, those two numbers could be taken in two different ways. You could see that audio is much more popular and therefore you should consider being an audio. But you could also look at this from the perspective of, hey, only 15% are publishing video. So if you publish video, then you may be able to stand out a little bit more than the audio. But then again, audio is more consumable. And there's a point on this a little bit later on that I'll tie these things together. 32% are blogging as well as podcasting in either video or audio form of podcasting. 32%, let's try and bump that number up. I know it can be difficult to blog, but your blog doesn't have to be lots of paragraphs. Your blog could be two paragraphs. Your blog could be sharing some information. It could be you release your podcast episode on Monday and you blog on Thursday or Friday. Something like that can be great. And I've talked about this in the past with Eileen, Miss Eileen from Miss Eileen Speaks podcast and basicblogtips.com. But 29% of these 4,400 podcasts are creating audio, video, and blog posts. And Todd also shared that of those shows creating all three formats, they grow 42% faster than the shows that just release audio or video. So if you want to grow your audience much, much faster, that's the way. Create more content and create it in more ways. Don't just release more podcast episodes. I'll cover that more in a moment too, but 
do look at releasing your content in more than one format. That's something I've been focusing on with the Audacity to podcast this year is trying to do more blog posts. Eh, haven't been so successful with that, but also trying to do more videos. And I've had about one video per month over the last year, and I'm hoping to increase that. I did just recently release two new videos on the podcast feed. If you want to subscribe to that in iTunes, it's the audacity to podcast.com slash iTunes video, or you can watch it on YouTube at the audacity to podcast.com slash YouTube, or just on the site. I did two videos reviewing the RE20 and the RE320 microphones. I really think you should check them out. I'll play some sound samples later on in this episode. 26% of the podcasts are mobile friendly in their website design. They may have some glitches here and there on different platforms, but for the most part, they work on mobile devices. That's great. That number needs to go up though. 26% is a good number, but it really should be, I think it should be 100% of the sites being mobile friendly. 68% have a Twitter link. 77% have a Facebook link. 56% have a Google Plus page or some kind of Google Plus link. This is great that you are in these different social networks and linking to them from your site. And I hope that you're using each of these social networks in a great optimized way and promoting your podcast very well in these networks. 23% of the podcasts have a Stitcher logo or a link. That number's small. It's great though to see that because this is up there with iTunes, really, I think, as far as reputation of or a a place that you need to post your podcast is in Stitcher, definitely. It's not as popular as iTunes, but it's extremely accessible. It's cross-platform, and it's in cars now. You can play it through websites. It's a great platform to be on, and 23% have a link to their Stitcher uh, page for their podcast. By the way, it's really easy to get these links on your site, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Stitcher, RSS, Podcast RSS, some of those, these other things I'll cover in a little bit with my plugin. Subscribe and follow.com if you want to check that out. It's my premium plugin for WordPress that puts these scalable vector graphics that look great on Retina displays for Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Stitcher, all of these things. There are certain logos I have that no one else has in their similar social network plugin, and I'm regularly looking for what new networks to add to this. Like there's Spreaker and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. Goodreads is even in their other networks. So you can check that out at subscribeandfollow.com. 31%, only 31% of these 4,400 podcasts are still using FeedBurner. That's down from 71% last year. That's an amazing drop. Good work. Now, the reason for that, FeedBurner has not announced its demise yet. I had been predicting that FeedBurner would announce, or Google would at least announce the retirement of FeedBurner this year. And that hasn't happened yet, and I might be proven wrong. But I do believe at some point, FeedBurner probably will be shut down or reduced in how useful it is. It's still okay to use FeedBurner for certain things. I just really don't recommend using the SmartCast feature if you're hosting a podcast, unless you're on one of these third-party non-branded sites like Libsyn, WordPress, Blogspot, anything like that. But people using their own RSS feeds that they entirely own and control is great. I do wonder with this 31%, where do people like me who are using FeedBurner but using my own domain fit in? So like feeds.noodle.mx slash the audacity to podcast, which is what you are most likely subscribed to that or feeds.noodle.mx slash the audacity to podcast hyphen MP3, well, you're subscribed to one of those. That is a FeedBurner filtered uh, feed, but it's using my own domain. So if FeedBurner ever shuts down, I don't even have to worry about 301 redirects. I just, I still have the domain. So where do I fit in that picture? Eh, I don't know. But at least for people using feeds.feedburner.com, that's definitely down. So good work there. 
If you want to learn how to leave FeedBurner, check out the audacity to podcast.com slash 97 and know that it's a lot easier nowadays. 51% are publishing episodes weekly. And along with this, of course, some pub- uh, they publish at least weekly, that is. So that means about half are publishing less frequently than once per week. And those shows, based on the statistics that Blueberry is able to track, those shows that publish less, publish less frequently than once per week grow 69% slower than the podcasts that publish once per week. And podcasts that publish more than once per week are about 44% of those podcasts that were submitted into the nominations. Those podcasts grow a lot faster. Look at Entrepreneur on Fire. I if, if John Lee Dumas had come to me asking me, hey, I want to do a daily podcast, I would have known this number said, yes, definitely do a daily podcast. It'll be a lot of work. Yeah. But daily podcast, more than weekly, essentially, grows much faster than just weekly. So if you're looking to grow your audience, consider releasing more episodes in a week. Now on to the bad stuff. 44% of these 1,400 or 4,400 nominated podcasts do not have a way to play or download the episode on the homepage. Eh, that's pretty bad. I know that you may, the PowerPress default option in which you may be using is that the player appears just on the post page or wherever the full post is displayed. But what I highly recommend if you're using PowerPress, go into your settings for PowerPress and enable that the player will show in excerpts too. And that will make a media player show up on your homepage of your site, depending on what kind of theme you're using, of course, but this helps it a lot more. Like if you go to the Audacity podcast, you see a listing of all of these episodes, you can press play on those episodes right from the homepage. And this is really important because if you're into analytics, then you may know about this idea of the bounce rate. And that is how quickly do people bounce away from your site? They go to your site, they glance at it, and then they bounce off of it. How quickly are people doing that? And this is really important to see on your homepage because you may have all of these episode titles like episode one, episode two, episode three, episode four, you know, really non-descriptive titles like that. And maybe very little show notes, very little descriptions about your podcast episodes. And you may want people to consume your content, but you're not actually giving away any of your content there on your front page. And especially if there's no play button, they can't even listen to a sample of your podcast unless they click through on something. And to get someone to click through on something is really a a commitment on their part that they are interested enough to click through. So you need to get them interested in order to click. So make sure you're explaining that information. Tell what you're about on the front page. Let some of your content show on the front page. I don't recommend full posts on the front page, but definitely have a play or download link on the front page for your episode so that when people visit your home page, they can press play on your latest episode, at least your latest episode, but I recommend your latest five episodes at least. 22% of video podcasters don't have a video embed on their site for their audience. This one, I, I see a couple different sides to this. One is PowerPress does provide a way for you to offer an embed code for your audience. And this could be either a video embed code or an audio embed code. And that can be a great way that your audience can then put your episode on their website. I'm a little skeptical about how many people actually do this and place your episode on their website, unless your episode is really short and very, very shareable. But even then, an embed code means that someone has to figure out how to embed your video and switch to pasting in HTML. The code can look a little intimidating. So I think there's a big barrier to entry here with the embed code on your site and for other people using it. I use, whenever I'm doing video episodes, 
I use the YouTube embedded player on my pages. And then there's the podcast player below that. And I, in, in some ways, I would rather people embed the YouTube player because I think it's easier for people to embed that. They're more familiar with it. A lot of content management systems will recognize a YouTube link and automatically embed it. And the YouTube for myself, the YouTube videos are high definition, much higher video quality than the podcast episodes that are downloadable, which are in 360p, that's 640 by 360 pixels. And my video is in 1920 by 1080, or at least 1280 by 720. So that's the 720p resolution or 1080p for the high quality. So this 22%, it's, yeah, it's a bad thing, but I don't know if it's that bad. 21% have an RSS icon on their default landing page that was podcast ready. That's, that's pretty bad. That means that you're, if you have an RSS icon on your site, that either it's not podcast ready or you don't have the RSS icon on your site make sure that you have that RSS icon. Again, my plugin, subscribeandfollow.com, can put that on your site. That's either just your standard RSS feed that is podcast ready, or you could have a podcast-only RSS feed with a specialized icon for that. 23% have a podcast RSS feed buried on a subpage of their website. I recommend having those a little more prominent on your site so that people can subscribe more easily. Even though RSS is not as popular for people to look for RSS links and such. It is still the technology that powers podcasting in many aggregation services. So RSS is not dying at all. Google is losing interest in RSS, but everything is still being powered a lot by RSS in many ways. So I don't think that's going away. And Providing an RSS link is great for when people have their own little app that they prefer to use or way they prefer to subscribe to your podcast. Giving them that RSS link allows them to do that. Maybe it's some obscure Linux podcast player, or maybe they want to use their own feed reader to subscribe to your podcast. Anything like that can read an RSS feed. And if you're not putting that out there for them, then they're not able to subscribe in the way they want to subscribe. 7% of the nominees have a visible contact email on their site. I'm not putting this in the ugly because this doesn't say whether it's the whole annoying bracket thing where the email address is completely unusable. But I can also understand why some podcasts might not want an email address on their site. Maybe they can't receive email. Maybe they just don't have the back end to support all the email they would receive and handle all of that long feedback. I give out our email address for all of our podcasts very readily. And especially for our Once Upon a Time podcast, some of the emails we get are so long. They are paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. And I can't use that in my podcast. Sometimes it's easier to get that feedback through Twitter where someone is limited to 140 characters to just give their quick thought or theory or feedback instead of writing out pages and pages and pages in an email. So I can understand why some people may not want email as a feedback method, but I do still think an email address should be visible on the site. Even if it's just a media contact or some kind of official contact email address, have that on your site. Use the plugin Cryptex, C-R-Y-P-T-X. Use that on your site in order to to encrypt your email address and also use Gmail as a, a receiving box. Don't use a Gmail address, but use Gmail as a receiving box so it can help block out some of the spam. And I get almost no spam in my inbox because everything goes to Gmail And even though I have my email address out there, I'm using Cryptex, so it's encoded, but it's still usable for humans. 12% have a newsletter sign-up page on their site. That's pretty good. It'd be great to see that number go up because RSS feeds, depending on what you're using, you may lose control of your RSS feeds. But email is also, I think, the best way to connect with people. 
because you send them an email, you are getting directly into their inbox. But it's also really easy for emails now to get lost or put into certain sorting fields or marked as spam. So this is a plus and a minus, but I do think popular podcasts, especially more business-oriented or profit-focused podcasts where you're trying to make money from your podcast, you should have some kind of email list set up. And I do have planned in the future an episode of the Audacity to Podcast to talk about how you can use an email list as a podcaster. Last bad thing here, before we get into the really ugly stuff, 15% have a call-in number or a widget of some sort, and that widget is probably something like SpeakPipe or something similar. Check out theaudacitypodcast.com slash SpeakPipe, which is my affiliate link for the SpeakPipe service. But 15%, again, I can see that maybe you're just not in a place where you can handle the feedback, or maybe you're concerned about receiving too much, maybe too little, maybe it's just not worth it to you, maybe... You're just not that kind of show that incorporates feedback very often in your podcast. I can see that being fine in many different cases, but it's something that you should know that it's not very often that these podcasts are putting out this information. So if you are making yourself more accessible, that you're putting your contact email address on the site, you're putting a call-in phone number or some kind of audio feedback widget, then you are doing better than... 90 or 85 percent of the podcasts out there you're more reachable more approachable than 85 percent that's a great place to be i would say it could even be bigger like if you put your contact email address out there then you are doing better than 97 percent of the podcasts out there so consider that now the ugly stuff 37% made a potential podcast listener dig through their website in order to find their podcast. If you have a podcast on your site, and I've I've spent a whole episode talking about something like this before, what your podcast website needs. If you have a podcast on your website, make it obvious that it's on your website. On the front page, there should be a podcast link somewhere or some information about your podcast right there on the front page. Don't make people have to dig through your site in order to find where your podcast is. Have a link somewhere, even if it's just a link to your podcast category or a widget somewhere that links to it, whatever. Make sure that it's obvious that if you have a podcast on your website, that it's on your website and how people can get to it. And I'd say how people can subscribe to it as well. This is terrible. This is this is almost profaning the name of podcasting. 80% of, I'm going to put air quotes around this, video podcasters, unquote, do not have an RSS feed or an iTunes listing. They're using YouTube. YouTube is a great place to post your video podcasts, but when you're on YouTube, and if you're only on YouTube, you are not a video podcast because a podcast by technical definition is not just episodic content, but it's episodic content published through an RSS feed using the enclosure tag. That is a podcast, an audio, video, or PDF or EPUB format. That's a podcast. YouTube is not a podcast. You cannot download videos off of YouTube. There are certain workarounds, sure. You can't get an RSS feed from YouTube. Again, there are certain kind of workarounds, but it's not designed for that. Being on YouTube does not make you a podcaster. It makes you a YouTuber or a web TV person, which I also don't like that term. But if you're a video podcaster, Make sure your video episodes are downloadable through an RSS feed. Yes, that means you're going to have to pay for some media hosting for your video podcast. But it's it's an important expense that you should pay because otherwise people won't be able to download and watch your videos offline unless they queue them up in YouTube or YouTube will soon be able to cache these things. But still, it's not a podcast subscription method. If you're a video podcaster, though, be on YouTube. All of my videos that I post for the Audacity podcast are also on YouTube, 
under a special playlist for podcasting. So you can go there, you can follow me on YouTube and watch my videos that way, or you can subscribe to the video edition of the Audacity to Podcast, and then you get the videos that way as well. That's a video podcast. No RSS feed means not a podcast. And 80% of the video podcasters didn't have an RSS feed. That That's ugly. That needs to change. It really, that's that's a illogical statement even because it's not a video podcast if it doesn't have an RSS feed. Anyway, continuing on. 23% have an invalid podcast RSS feed. It's broken in some way. Interestingly, SoundCloud and other certain third-party RSS providers were the biggest culprits in this. So if you're using SoundCloud or if you're using whatever, if you're a podcaster and you're putting out an RSS feed, make sure it validates. Go to feedvalidator.org and put in your RSS feed and make sure it validates. The warnings are okay. Some of them. Some of them you might want to fix. But some things are just a little unavoidable simply because feed validator doesn't account for everything. So it just gives a certain warning basically saying, hey, I don't recognize this. But if it says your feed is invalid, fix those problems right away. The biggest problem I see for causing invalid feeds is some kind of invalid character or a bad character in your titles or in your URLs. What I often recommend is if you see something is messing up, then try retyping some of it because there are certain times where maybe a space looks like a normal space to you, but it's actually a fancy kind of space. There are different kinds of spaces you might not realize, but there are. And so retype these things. Quotation marks can sometimes mess things up or certain kinds of hyphens or vertical slashes or slashes can mess up certain things. So try retyping, resync your feed if you're using FeedBurner and then run it through Feed Validator again. But that's the biggest culprit I see to invalid feeds is something in the title or in the text just isn't where it should be or isn't the character it should be. And you may not even realize it unless you retyped it and then submit it again. So watch out for those kinds of things, especially in your titles. 56% of the podcasts, again, these are just of the nominees, not the finalists, but all of the 4,400 nominees, 56% did not have a findable RSS feed anywhere on their site. Ouch. This means that even if you're in our, in iTunes, that when you go to your website, you're not letting people subscribe in the way they want to subscribe or with some other app they have. And sometimes on these mobile devices now, if there's an RSS link, you can tap on it and the mobile device, like an Android phone or an iPhone, will open that RSS feed in an applicable program that the person might be used to using if it's not iTunes or some other popular podcast service like that. That number needs to go down. It needs to be a findable RSS feed on your site. I suggest having a link. Of course, I recommend my plugin for it, but there are other ways that you can do it too. And here's a really terrible one. This is absolutely ugly. 82% of the podcasts have less than one paragraph of show notes for their past five episodes. Less than one paragraph paragraph that's a couple sentences and the value of that to google or other search engines is about zero i get a lot of people visiting our websites because of our very thorough show notes and i'm not saying your show notes have to be as thorough as mine are where it's practically a blog post but you should have more than just a few sentences more than a paragraph. Have a few paragraphs in there. Have several paragraphs. Have a bullet point list of several things plus some paragraphs. But the paragraphs are there not only for your listeners, but also for your potential listeners. Because every time you're putting out new content, you're getting a little bit more attention from Google. And Google is prioritizing higher quality content. And if you have less than a paragraph in your show notes, that's not high quality content. And it's probably not rich with certain keywords that people may be looking for that should connect them to your podcast. 
So for example, in my Once Upon a Time podcast, frequently in the show notes, we use the word podcast or the words Once Upon a Time or the the title of the particular episode of the TV show that we're talking about, because those are things people will be looking for. And it's a lot better for the reader instead of just saying this episode, this episode, this episode, this episode, the context gets lost shortly after they start reading, but rehashing these things. So that doesn't mean every single time to say the name of the episode of the TV show or whatever particular keyword phrase that you're going after, but do try and put it in where it fits and where it's not spammy in your posts and write good show notes. Think of it as a blog post. Think about could someone consume your content and understand what you want them to get from your content by reading your show notes. When your show notes are to that level, then you're at the right level. But if your show notes are just a excerpt of your podcast or your show notes are just a couple of the links that you mentioned, then you are not focusing on your potential listeners. You're only focusing on the listeners that you have. And even then, it may not be extremely useful to them if you're not putting in that extra content. 82%. That's a massive number. That needs to drop down. Now, you may not be guilty of many of these things, and I hope I don't come across too harshly to those who are, but these things do need to change. But there are some great things, though, that you can learn from this. And social media is a great place, great way to connect people with you and with your podcast and continue putting those links on your site. Create great podcast episodes, great content out there. Because Todd Cochran is CEO of Blueberry and Raw Voice that provides some great stats, I highly recommend them. They track more than 17,000 podcasts. And of all of this data, they shared some interesting overall statistics. Audiences were very heavy in the United States of America, 79% there, 10% from Canada, and 9% from the United Kingdom. Obviously, this is for English podcasts. If you have a foreign language podcast, then those numbers are going to be drastically different iTunes accounts for 67% of the audience across all devices. And that means not just Windows and OS X, but also iOS devices that are using iTunes, essentially using iTunes to download the podcast. So that is the place to be. And your numbers may be different, sure. But this is what they see as an average across their 17,000 podcasts that they're tracking. And browsers were definitely the biggest share after that, after iTunes, but Todd didn't share what that number was specifically. For myself, I see that browsers account for more than half of my downloads of all of my episodes. And a lot of that is because our show notes are bringing people in from Google and other search engines. So they come to the site, they see a play button that's visible on the homepage or on the actual page, and they press play, they listen to the podcast that way on the site. It's tying it all together, things that we should be doing as podcasters. If your podcast is on a set-top box, such as Roku, Boxy, some of these things, that is on average getting 8% or representing 8% of the downloads. And if you have your own app for your podcast. That can be really cool and allows you to connect with your audience in really awesome ways. And depending on what plan you have from Libsyn.com, you may be able to make an app for free that can be on Android, iOS, and even Windows phone. But these apps, as far as Blueberry can tell, these apps are only tracking at 1% of the downloads. This number though, 1%, For these podcast-focused apps, not like iTunes or uh, not uh, the podcast app or Downcast, Instacast, any of those, but these would be like the 5 by 5 app, or I think there's a Twit app, and I've been working on a Noodle Mix Network app, those kinds of things, where it's an app for the podcast or for the podcast network. Only 1% are of the downloads are coming through these third-party apps. And I can see where this number could easily be inaccurate. Here's a prime example. If you're using Libsyn to create your app for your podcast, 
and you're using Libsyn as your media host, but you're also using Blueberry for your statistics service. Any download that you receive through your mobile app that Libsyn created won't be tracked by Blueberry. And that's because the stats that Libsyn tracks are based on their hosted URL, not the full URL that Blueberry gives you. So if you want to be able to track through Blueberry and your app that Libsyn provides, then you need to start doing some more advanced stuff over at Libsyn, and maybe someday I'll show you how to do that. And of all of the podcast devices out there, there were a hundred different kinds of devices or clients detected and 126 countries with at least 10 downloads represented for podcast episodes. And this is the average of the 17,000 podcasts. Your numbers will obviously probably be different. But now let's think about the hard question. Why wasn't your podcast a finalist? If you submitted your podcast, you think you meet all of these requirements, you might be thinking, yeah, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, I'm not doing that, I'm doing all the good things, not doing the bad and ugly things, then why wasn't your your podcast a finalist? Well, clearly, the number of nominations does matter a lot. That goes back to the breakdown of how things are graded. But also, a lot of podcasters are actually ineligible and they didn't realize it. Here is what on the Podcast Awards site they say makes you eligible for the podcast awards. They say, number one, sites that have won people's choice or best produced in the years 2011 or 2012 are not eligible to win the people's choice and best produced. So essentially the last two years, if you've won either of those, then you're not eligible to win people's choice or best produced again for two years. Sites that have won people's choice or best produced in 2012 or the previous year, are not eligible to win in any category. And here's the real important thing for podcasters out there. You must have been podcasting actively on or before January 1st, 2013. And they verify this by reviewing the website and probably checking some stuff to see, did you really publish episodes before then, or did you just backdate some of your more current episodes? I know that I've heard other podcasts say, hey, go nominate us in the awards, nominate us. And their podcast is three months old, six months old. Yeah, it's it's too young. That's a big thing that I think podcasters are not realizing that's in the rules. And then those nominations are really being wasted because they could spend that time saying, hey, we're not eligible because we're too young of a podcast. But please nominate our other podcast or nominate this other podcast that we really like. And must have created at least 10 episodes before October 1st, 2013, or the voting period when the nomination period, that is, starts, which is usually October 1st through 15th for the nominations. And the podcast must have a visible podcast RSS feed on the podcaster site with enclosures. If your podcast doesn't have that, it's not eligible. So then it comes back to the grading of after they've decided what podcasts are eligible, what's the grading that goes into this? Again, it's 40% from the number of nominations. Less than half comes from just your numbers. 20% comes from the relevance of your content. 15% from the website design quality. I do think that's really important for podcasters that you have a great-looking website. 15% comes from sound quality, 10% from podcast delivery and show format quality. So if you had a lot of nominations, you may not have made it in as a finalist because of one of these other things. Maybe your website looks terrible. Maybe you aren't old enough for your podcast, that is, your podcast old enough. Maybe your sound quality is terrible. Or maybe you meet all of these other things, but some of the smaller details made it a lot harder to get in. When the numbers are tight, it really comes down to these little details. And these are the things that if you pay attention to these, you can boost your chances of making it into the podcast awards as a finalist. And just being a finalist is a huge honor. 
and it brings people to your site depending on how well your podcast is named and where you fit in in the different um, listings of the podcast awards. And there are many of these things that I can help you with as a podcast consultant. I'd love to work with you. You can check out theaudacitypodcast.com slash consulting if you'd like to hire me to help you launch or improve your podcast. And I've got something in the works in the future for people who really want to improve their podcasts and take their podcasting super seriously. And it's not for the faint of heart. And that's coming, I'm hoping to announce it in the next month or so. I'm really excited about it and it will be really awesome. But again, not for the faint of heart. My Once Upon a Time podcast last year made it into the finalist position for the entertainment category, but it didn't this year for entertainment. However, it did for best produced. And that just tells me that either our numbers for the nominations weren't high enough, or maybe there were some of these points that we didn't quite hit, whereas some other podcasts did. But I think in that case, it's probably more the numbers, because I'm pretty sure we hit these points correctly on all of the important ones. But it could be some of the, the other stuff, our production quality or delivery format and some of this other stuff. So the podcast awards are every year. This is the ninth annual one, and they do still need donations and sponsorships. This is a great opportunity for you to get your podcast in front of thousands and thousands of people, and it only costs $250 to put your podcast logo on the sidebar, and it stays up there for a year. I'm still receiving clicks from the podcast awards just by being a finalist, but the banners are so much more attractive. So for $250, I think it could be worth it to you if you're trying to grow your audience much more. We're trying a little experiment with the podcasters roundtable. That's why you'll see it in there as one of the sponsors. We're trying to see how well this grows the audience for podcasters roundtable. That's at podcastersroundtable.com. Ray Ortega, Dave Jackson, and I co-host that. But the Awards also do need some more money in order to pay for all of the awards, the hosting, all of the expenses of it. They need still about $2,000 more. So that could be 10 podcasts out there or or so. So if you want to get your podcast in front of many different people, look at that podcast sponsorship, maybe look at a corporate sponsorship even. And here's something that's really cool. If you were an award finalist in the past, you can order now an award finalist trophy for eh, $200, which is quite expensive. Or if you are a finalist in one of those top two categories, the best produced or people's choice, then you can get one of those special finalist awards for $365. This isn't for if you won, but if you were just a, an award finalist in any of the last eight, or even this one, the last several podcast awards. I've considered this because it would be really cool to have all of these different awards for our podcast because now up to this point, all of our Noodle Mix Network pre-2013 podcasts are now award finalists, which is really cool. I'm really honored by that. And thank you so much for your support. So do check that out at podcastawards.com. And if you can make it to the awards ceremony, it'd be great to see you there. It will be held Sunday night, January 5th at New Media Expo. And you can sign up at theaudacitypodcast.com slash NMX. Use my promo code Daniel20 and you'll save 20% on your registration. They may provide some kind of special low-cost ticket for people who just want to come to the awards or maybe some kind of day pass or an evening pass, something like that. But definitely, if you are in the finalists, be there for the award ceremony because it's pretty sad when they have to say, so-and-so won the podcast award and there's no one to come up and accept the award. Oh, so embarrassing. Now, if you can't make it and you listen to this podcast regularly, I'm willing to be a stand-in for you, depending on how many of you ask this. But uh, several people did ask me of this last year to represent them at the podcast awards. So if you receive an award, I would go up, accept it for you, and read some kind of acceptance speech or say something about your podcast, whatever it might be that you might want. I'm willing to do that for you guys as listeners to the Audacity to Podcast. If you're interested in that, 
please email me feedback at the audacity to podcast.com. I'd love to uh, honor you in that way and give you the chance to be represented there. And instead of that, just blank silence. And it's a great way to promote your podcast too, which you know, I'll probably do some of that too for you. And the, uh, the awards ceremony will most likely be live streamed as well at podcastawards.com. If you have a podcast in the podcast awards, make sure that you've registered at podcastawards.com, not just the nominations. This is something else. They need a list of all of the podcasts that are participating in the awards. Even if you're not going to be there, make sure you're on that list because they need to know exactly how your podcast needs to be written in case you win the award. So that's really important for you. Make sure that you register your podcast. Now, several of our podcasts in the Noodle Mix Network have made it into the finalist positions, and I would love your support for these by voting every day starting on November 1st and going through November 15th. If you go to the audacitytopodcast.com slash podcast awards, you'll see how you can vote for us and also sign up for the email list to be notified every day and reminded to vote. We also have a Facebook group now, so you can sign up that way to get your daily reminders to go vote for the podcast. But the way that you can support us in the podcast awards, go to podcastawards.com or the audacitypodcast.com slash podcast awards to learn more and vote under these categories, under people's choice, beyond the to-do list, under best produced once, once upon a time podcast, under business, beyond the to-do list, again, under comedy, the ramen noodle clean comedy podcast, under uh, under religion inspiration, are you just watching? And under technology, the audacity to podcast. If you have a podcast that's in the finalist position, please email that to me because I was I would love to recommend other community members. Like I'll mention just a couple of others here. I am not a sports person. But Nick Suberlin is a great guy. He's a, a friend of mine. And I'm going to be voting for Who Day Weekly every day during the podcast awards. That's the podcast I'll be voting for. If you want your podcast recommended in my blog post about the podcast awards, and or even just a shout out to say, hey, these are some of the other community members that you should consider voting for. If you don't have anyone to vote for in these categories, please let me know. Uh, But do understand if we're in the same category, then I'll be promoting my own podcast. But also definitely the other podcast I'll definitely vote for every day under the general category, Dave Jackson's School of Podcasting is in there. So I'll definitely be voting for that every day, as well as voting for all of the Noodle Mix Network podcasts that are in there. And that's at theaudacitypodcast.com slash podcast awards. I will have those links in the show notes along with all of the links for everything else that I mentioned over at the audacity to podcast.com slash 148. And if you'd like to send feedback or questions for future episodes of the audacity to podcast, email feedback at the audacity to podcast.com or call and leave a voicemail at 903 231 2221. You can also go to the audacity to podcast.com on your computer or iOS device and send a voice message right from the website. Please follow me on Twitter at The Ramen Noodle. And let me know if there's any way that I can help you in podcasting, website design, podcast cover art design, anything like that. I'd love to work with you and help you succeed in podcasting. Now that I've given you some of the guts and taught you some of the tools, it's time for you to go podcast with passion, organization, and dialogue. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the Audacity to Podcast.com. Thank you for listening. The Audacity to Podcast is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of